I first heard about the Balboa Park midnight water gun fight of 2012 from an acquaintance on his lunch break. His name is Xavier. He's a young black man of impeccable dress and searching curiosity who I knew to be involved in several tech ventures, but whose actual job I've never learned. He asked if I planned on going, and when I admitted I hadn't heard about it, his eyes lit up as he described the concept, a flash mob cultural happening organized out of nothing but a single Facebook invitation circulated organically by digital culture. Mm. <laughs> See, Xavier, Xavier did not give a toss about water guns or a youthful transgression. No, he was excited over the opportunity to witness a communal celebration forming on its own accord here in San Diego, the kind of utopian gesture where social media was blazing trails for, the kind of unstructured jubilee reported in cities known more for their ingenuity than their weather. <laughs> he promised to forward me the invitation, and true to his word, a notice popped up on my screen in the time it took him to return to his computer. It was 300 people by then already had signaling that they would assemble as directed by the Great Fountain in Balboa Park on Saturday, August 11. At the time I signed up, it was only the beginning of July. The event page suggested participants dress up for the occasion. The more outlandish, the better. The online invitation was removed after the event before I could verify, but to my memory there were explicit instructions not to bring water balloons on account of the litter that they would create, which struck me most about the, invi the invite's text or the comments that were made on that event invite. We all know how Facebook works. It was one of the few rare slap in the face moments where you're reading a page and you can't figure out right away why, you, why you're reacting to it and then you realize, Jesus Christ, there's absolutely no irony here at all. It was the most sincerity in the era of cynical snipe I'd encountered for a long time. So by the time the prescribed date rolled around, nearly 2,000 people had RSVP'd, half of them in the thumbs up. And I picked up my friend, we'll call her Clarice, <laughs> because she's a high school, uh, junior high school teacher. And we parked by the lot by the Great Fountain minutes before the announced kickoff at 11.30. We got out of our little car, and there was only a few scant groupings of these 20-year-olds milling around, quiet with this kind of anxiety of anticipated disappointment that you learn growing up here. <laughs> <laughs> but then, as though Zeus had rained down his eternal seat upon us, this man came out whose physique made me regret having ever eaten anything. <laughs> ever, especially if I ever ate it outside of a gym. <laughs> he strode past in a Speedo, and I recognized his face from the event's Facebook invitation as its originator, Ken St. Pierre. <laughs> Ken announced that the starting point had been relocated to the reflecting pool because the great fountain was down for repairs. Pass it on, he called. How do you say no? Clusters of people numbering in the low hundreds at that time had gathered on the botanical garden side of the lily pond. Their demographics were cast from a wide net. SDSU frat boys in camouflage. Yes, we all know, Call of Duty, very fun. Cheers. Uh, several Olympic swim teams worth of statuesque gay men in Speedos. <laughs> Filipino dudes from Mila Mesa were formed already into fire teams, taking it deadly serious. There were actually a few Muslim girls in attendance and headscarves, and one very heavily accessorized Jack Sparrow looked like. <laughs> and then beyond this, there was a small army of men and women dressed up for a casual Comic Con, let's say, and lots and lots of ordinary people dressed totally, totally ordinarily. My other friend, we'll call her uh, Nate. Ask one man in a group who was wearing a similar grease paint. They were all wearing similar grease paint, like, oh, dear hunter, yeah. Uh, if they were all on a team together, and he replied to her, there are no teams here, there are only enemies. <laughs> by midnight, that crowd had grown by hundreds and would continue to grow over the next hour towards and probably over a thousand. 
At a quarter past, without fanfare or warning, an air horn was blown, and the scene erupted into the stuff of adolescent fantasy. <laughs> Everybody began dashing nowhere in particular. Screaming, laughing, blurs of just white teeth grinning in the darkness. I've never, honestly, I have never seen so many people smiling for such a sustained amount of time without the aid of alcohol, the mar of violence, or the motives of corporate sponsorship. Now the first problem to arise in retrospect was predictable. Water guns dry fast. And while several people brought jugs to refill themselves, the vast majority had not. And the principal preoccupation quickly became how to keep the fun going. Figures hunched along the ponds edged at regular, at regular intervals, dipping their plastic toys between the reeds and the lily pads. Someone might have said something, but it became common practice immediately. I saw a middle-aged woman shout, to a teenage boy to stop throwing water balloons unless he was going to pick them up afterwards. And the boy did hesitate until she walked around the corner. And then he resumed lobbing artillery with impressive accuracy wherever that crowd was densest. Some adolescents jumped into the small recessed portion of the pond, but my friend, Clarice, got out and with her practiced teacher's tone said, get the fuck out of there! <laughs> She'd been waiting years to say that at children. But she gave up once about a half dozen grown-ups followed him in, because she knows who she can yell at. You see, this is why you need to designate who the adults are, she said. This is the ones who are going to fuck it up for everybody. Foreshadowing. Those among the crowd who were prone to excess made their presence known around 12.40 in the morning. A, tw a tall, gangly man appeared to be living out a fantasy in the stormtrooper helmet of a Star Wars clone, dominating the night with a kind of high-pressure hand pump that disgorged its entire load by the half gallon in a single deluge. He rhythmically dipped the gun's tip back into the lily pond to suck up another shot and then released again and then again and then again. A college-aged guy in a jersey dispensed with water guns altogether and just used a mop bucket he'd apparently <laughs> brought for the purpose to douse entire groups of people with pond water. Another man, 10 years his senior, his waterlogged short sliding off his skinny little ass, <laughs> reappropriated the igloo cooler he'd brought for the same purpose. I'm from East County. I know when someone's from East County. <laughs> Two couples had taken to making out in the pond, foreglowing uh, any kind of play for romance among the reeds, and I wondered if they would contract dysentery. <laughs> And then my favorite, a shirtless, skinny, bespeckled fellow floated around in a sort of alligator impersonation. His eyes, the only part of him above the waterline, with a lily pad resting on his head like Mr. Toad's yarmulke. And he watched and he waited until a girl stooped to refill her gun before he raised his gun and shot her in the face. And while all of this was going on, water was running in the gutters at a volume equal to what a light rain would probably cause. The enterprising among the crowd who had not raid the lily pond for ethics and foresight stooped to refill their guns out of that stream. That's going to be nasty with all the dirt and oil they're <laughs> scooping up, a man in a turquoise thong remarked upon <laughs> observing. The crowd began to thin around 1 a.m. In what I partially interpreted as disapproval of this increasingly uh, misbehaving minority. And if the, if the destruction wrought by these few was not appropri drawing appropriate attention, then honestly, I have to testify here, it was because of their being lodged within the context of a thousand other people who were very well behaved on their own accord with absolutely no oversight to speak of, for the record. And then around 1.30 a.m.
Beer horn sounded again in this long, sustained blast and lassoed Lilypad Boy with an invisible force and all of his friends, this remaining hundreds who were still there into this close mass, cheering and firing their guns in the air. Somebody began shouting, USA, USA, fueled by what probably at the time was Olympic medal fever. <laughs> and the crowd immediately took up the chant in celebration of what was really this rare freedom that within 24 hours, without knowing it, would lead to their absolute public condemnation. Glad they got to know what it was like to be an American for that long. <laughs> As my friends and I walked back to the car that night, a police helicopter passed overhead and then slowed, seemed to hesitate in its trajectory, and then began circling widely within view of the lily pond and its remaining revelers. You know, if a helicopter could look confused, that one did. <laughs> I turned to Clarice and mentioned how shocked I was that not a single cop or security guard had shown up during the entire two and a half hours we'd been there. I asked her what she thought would be more surprising if the SDPD hadn't even known about a party of that enormity, one that lasted for nearly three hours and had been announced a month in advance, or if they had known and just chosen not to intervene because they have real problems to solve. They had to have known, she said, there's no way Maybe they didn't think it would matter in a, com in a crowd that big, offered the other friend. Of course they would, she said. Look at who was there. A bunch of pussy little bitches like us. You know, if they, somebody told them to go home, everybody would have shuffled their feet and said, okay. <laughs> but I'll tell you this right now. If one asshole accidentally killed one of those fish, everybody's going to be in a lot of trouble. And everything good about tonight will be forgotten. Of partying in Balboa Park causes tens of thousands of dollars in damage to a San Diego jewel. A water gun fight got way out of hand, and this morning some rare koi fish are dead and beautiful plants are trashed. News 8 Steve Price joins us live in Balboa Park right now with a look at the damage to the famous lily pond. Steve. And Dan, I'll tell you, thanks to a major cleanup out, uh, effort out here yesterday, the area does not look nearly as bad today as it did yesterday. That said, behind me, you can see plants that were definitely trampled. And then we started taking a closer look. And you can still see there are balloon pieces all over the place out here. But it wasn't just a problem with trash out here. They also trashed the lily pond. Too bad so accordingly, the next morning news cycle was dominated by San Diego TV news communities, waspish, most harbingers of doom. <laughs> I envy his hair, I lie not. CBS's local San Diego affiliate won the prize, though, for both her per hyperbole, fabricating hysterica, and just plain shitty reporting through the knit-browed, pearl-clutching Shannon Handy and Angelique Lazarde, who referred to the water gun fighters as hooligans, and who announced in turn that they'd spoken to several people, because that's how journalism works, <laughs> who had told them that all the fish were either dead or expected to die. Of course, it fell to the long-suffering Katie Orr, the Metro reporter of KPBS, a real news organization, who was the first to correct them by reporting that, in fact, no koi had died. But even after she did so, CBS not only failed to correct their story, they re-syndicated the bullshit version to their affiliates from Los Angeles to Virginia, proving once and for all that CBS San Diego is to journalism what the orange dusting on a Cheeto is to actual cheese. <laughs> Now, when I ran this article that I wrote in San Diego City Beat, investigative reporter Dave Moss aptly <laughs> phrased the reaction it had received online from their viewers as the progressive equivalent of how conservatives would probably have responded if uh, the more, much more, conservative Union Tribune had run a story about some illegal immigrant raping a white woman. <laughs> calls for waterboarding and caning of the pr organizers and participants quickly flooded the comments section. <laughs> when it was revealed that Ken St. Pierre had worked on the LGBT pride parade, several internet commenters jumped on the opportunity to blame the entire incident on the gays. 
One commenter on CBS's site, anonymously, of course, posted, was this sponsored by the gay community? They're not satisfied wearing their boas and garter belts <laughs> while flaunting common sense morality. <laughs> now they have to tear the parks apart with their ruckus behavior. <laughs> Take your whips and chains and stay in ill-dressed. How Dickensian of the bigots. <laughs> so it was only after three days of unethically bad follow-up reporting by the local news affiliates and column after column of these eye-rolling, nostril-flaring, vitriolic outrage pourings by the San Diego community, many of whom are my friends and the spouses of my friends, that I finally, after all of this, kind of developed an indignation pustule of my very own. And here is where I will stop re reporting to you the story that I wrote for City Beat and talk to you as a friend. <laughs> First of all, side note, I'm amazed how many people thought I was there to fuck up the lily pond even though I brought a fucking SLR digital camera and a telephoto lens. Because that's what you bring to a water gun fight when you're not a reporter, right? When you but here's what pisses me off, all right? Back in March of the same year, when 14-year-old Richard Correa was killed by a random drive-by shooting in the Mount Hope neighborhood, none of the people I saw losing their shit over this lily pond fiasco said one goddamn word. And when I reported on how Anastasio Hernandez Rojas was tasered to death by the Border Patrol here in San Diego back in 2010, none of those people could be bothered to type out a response online to the article, much less march down the street with pitches, pitchforks and torches in hand. But when a bunch of careless, well-meaning, somewhat stupid kids started a couple, startled a couple of expensive fish at long last, I witnessed my generation and its media wake from their long, infinitely long slumber and announce to the world exactly what they would and would not stand for. And so out of all of the characters in this little, pithy, local, your town San Diego drama, it's to the people who picked this to be their crowning moment of outrage that I say, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Justin Huggall, everybody.